In this episode of the Smart City podcast, I interviewed fellow member of the Smart Cities Council Emerging Innovators, Oliver Locke. Ollie and I had a lot to discuss. We had a great conversation about what Smart Cities means to Ollie, what Ollie is doing in this space, which includes a PhD, and where we're moving forward in the tech and data kind of space. With a background in architecture, Ollie has cross-pollinated um, with programming, all things tech and data, and we really dive deep into this. So as always, I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. It's the Smart City Podcast, whoa, with smart city experts, here we go. Connecting smart technology, both big and small. Smart cities are making life better for all. Big data, emerging trends, self-driving cars and more. The Smart City Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Ollie. How are you? Good, thanks, So. That's good. Let's just jump straight into this. And can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you're passionate about? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name's uh, Oliver Locke or Ollie Locke. Um, I'm Australian. Um, I'm currently in Sydney doing a PhD at University of New South Wales um, at UNSW um, based in two labs, um, one called the City Analytics Lab, um, which is in architecture and planning. Um, the other one's called the Epi Center or Expanded Perception Interaction Centre, um, and that's in art and design focused on human-computer interaction. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in maps, uh, the design of maps, designing geographic information. Um, I'm getting a growing interest in issues in digital democracy, um, and I'm really interested in how we use data um, to amplify decisions, um, to engage people, excite people, inspire people about cities. That's awesome. Yeah. So what kind of sparked your interest in this smart city space? Yeah, um, so it was actually it was quite interesting because about, I guess, ten, nearly 10 years ago, which is really embarrassing uh, for me now, I, I was studying um, architecture and I, I found while I was studying architecture, I did a kind of computer science uh, informatics elective um, and I, I realised that I was actually much better at programming than architecture, but I really liked the space of architecture. Um, so I've been kind of exploring the space for a, a long time. Um, I moved to urban planning and kind of figured out that I really like analyzing urban data. Um, and there was no job market for me after graduating urban planning and informatics, um, which kind of might seem bizarre now. But yeah, back then I just kind of went into IT and then I kept on pursuing, pushing to get into the city space. I moved to London, uh, did a research degree on big data and transport in San Francisco. Um, and now I've been working in kind of the transport planning, urban planning, digital space uh, for quite a few years now. Yeah, awesome. So this is a bit philosophical, but what is a smart city to you? Oh, wow. Um, so for me, the um, the main bits of smart city that interest me are smart mobility and smart governance. Um, so I'm interested in... Um, the aspects of smart mobility of kind of active transport, getting people to move around um, healthily, such as walking and cycling, um, planning mobility in such a way that um, encourages access to amenities. Um, so you've got, you know, your schools, hospitals, education, jobs, all in a, a kind of accessible um, dimension, whether that be time or um, geographic space, um, and also using data that is generated in um, transport systems like intelligent transport systems data, uh, GPS data, uh, sensor data from vehicles. Um, so, yeah, smart cities for me is that smart mobility space um, and also smart governance. So I, I mentioned I was getting interested in the more um, democratic space uh, about trying to engage people and get them to understand how decisions are being made and getting people actually participating through a lot of the new platforms that we have. Yeah, cool. So why do you think this smart city concept is so important? Um, I think I, I think it's important because it, it kind of uh, it adds more kind of computational and quantitative rigor to um, a lot of the work that is being doing being done in planning. Um, it makes it a little bit more scientific, um, and I think uh, in a, a lot of ways that uh, we've been doing this smart city stuff for a long time. But I think the kind of brand of the smart city is doing really well in advocating this. So let's talk about some of the 
things you're working on at the moment? Yeah, um, so I guess my PhD is exploring um, interfaces. It's exploring um, kind of how do we... Um, so it's really hard <laughs> to explain your PhD. People have um, have big competitions about it. Um, so it's kind of about how people can collaborate passively with data that's being collected about them. Um, so how do people collaborate um, with their Twitter data or their Opal data? How do they participate in decisions that are being made about cities? Um, how can they collaborate and deliberate in group settings using um, technical models um, that are usually used by professionals using multi-touch interfaces? Um, and how do people um, individually act collectively in metaphysical space, such as using things like mixed reality and augmented reality um, headsets? Um, so I'm kind of studying um, how we design these interfaces, um, particularly in what I was talking about, the smart mobility um, context there. So how do we design inf interfaces that allow people uh, to passively or collaborative or, or individually act collectively um, to improve access to amenities, um, to improve ITS systems, to improve or encourage active transport? Um, as well as that, I'm working, uh, I've been doing a little bit of teaching on a new Master of City Analytics course at UNSW, um, teaching people um, or planners programming, um, getting people to think um, in that space that I was trying to build myself um, a while ago. Um, so that's really exciting um, to be a part of as well. Yeah, definitely. And so you're part of um, our Emerging Innovators group as well. So I'm interested to hear what how you kind of came, became involved and um, what your kind of hopes or plans or dreams are in that space. Yeah, so I got involved um, through Claire, who was also um, also interviewed in this podcast, um, and she went to the same university that I went to in London. Um, and I guess I've been mainly involved uh, through chatting with you guys via Slack, um, and I'm really interested in, I guess, connecting uh, connecting the industry groups to the groups that are forming within um, universities, connecting students to opportunities to um, speak or collaborate with people in industry. And I guess I'm really, I really want people to be able to um, engage together and form a network of people that are supporting this movement um, all around Australia. Um, and yeah, I guess I've kind of, I've taken up um, tentatively a kind of education a coordinator or facilitator uh, in the group. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's kind of what I'm interested in at the moment. Yeah, cool. So you talk about education. Obviously, you're very, well, it sounds like you're very passionate about that space. How important do you think that is in the smart city kind of um, concept? Yeah, I think it, I think it's very important. Um, for example, uh, if you look at the, I think it's the Smart Cities and Suburbs program, which is a very large uh, fund set out by the government, you're seeing very, very large sums of money um, being poured out into smart city initiatives. Um, and some of these things are things like 3D models and so forth. Um, and that technology is changing very quickly and the skill set to create technology is actually becoming quite achievable for someone with a planning background to actually learn in a few weeks and uh, apply really well. Um, so I think having a strong baseline of skills in the uh and a strong continuing professional development in these skills is really important in a space that moves as fast as um, smart cities and technology. Um, so we need to kind of really open up that, these channels for planners. Um, as well as that, yeah, if you think about like um, how when you plug in a printer, it never really works. Um, how, or if, you know, your iPhone um, ch charger plug changes every few few years like these kind of thing the kind of technological issues if we apply them to cities are going to happen at a large scale and if we have one organization using one set of technical skills or one professional using uh, a different set of uh, technical skills to another we're going to have these really strange issues of uh, technological incompatibility uh, with all these embedded technologies so yeah i guess it's important to educate people and make sure they have the same baseline um, and that we're all kind of on the same page with what we know yeah, definitely. And one of my key interest areas is smart mobility as well. So I'm interested to hear more about um, your thoughts on that. You talked about active transport and obviously the buzzwords are, you know, autonomous vehicles and all that kind of stuff um, and, you know, mass mobility as a service. What are your, what's your take on, on, on those type of buzzwords? 
Yeah, I mean, I was lucky enough to, um, I was at the planning conference in Perth uh, almost a month ago now, um, and we got to drive in one of the uh, uh, driverless buses. Um, and I was orig- I was originally quite sceptical of uh, autonomous vehicles, but going in that bus, it actually felt very, very safe. And for me, I, I think the what we should be focusing on with autonomous vehicles in particular is the safety element. And I think a lot of people are focusing on the safety element um, rather than um, the efficiency element. So a lot of people are saying, you know, this is going to be a more efficient system or we need to respond to the demand as well as we can. But I think once you start designing a system to re- be efficient and respond to demand as quickly as possible, you're also pushing aside of a lot of other social, environmental um, considerations with that as well. Um, and I, I kind of wonder um, whether the city wanted to be optimised or whether it wanted to be something else. Yeah, yeah, cool. Because I know, like, uh, for me, autonomous vehicles, particularly connected autonomous vehicles, has so much potential, um, but it seems maybe we're not uh, talking about exactly what that means because people don't necessarily understand what that potential will be yet because there's so much uncertainty. Um, How do you think it kind of fits in with that active transport space? Are you concerned that, you know, instead of walking or being on a bike, we'll all be cruising around in our autonomous pods? Yeah, I think think that's a lot of people's concerns. It's like um, there's that movie WALL-E when you've got all the humans on the tropical island floating around in pods, having soda fed to them, um, slowly becoming less and less skilled at pretty much every uh, manual task. I think that's the kind of uh, dystopian view of these. Um, I'm hoping that uh, these kind of mobility as a service packages uh, that that might include autonomous vehicles uh, would include, like, for some somehow be linked in with your health app that might encourage you to, you know, go to a certain location and then do this or maybe uh, send you little prompts while you're in the in the vehicle saying, you know, do you want to stop at this gym before you go home or something? I'm hoping that there's some kind of integration there. Otherwise, um, yeah, we're just going to reduce the, um, the kind of door-to-door walking between pretty much every A and B, which will uh, inevitably reduce everyone's amount of steps, which is quite concerning. Mm, yeah, definitely. Let's talk about Australia a little bit. And how do you think Australia is embracing the smart city concept? Yeah, so as I mentioned, there was that kind of large pot of money um, being brought into um, smart city projects, which is awesome. I think Australia are, are, le- are very much leading um, a lot of energy and um, positive energy towards smart cities, which is great. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of conferences here recently. Um, there are a lot coming up. Um, yeah, I think Australia is doing really, really well. Um, and I think even our kind of prime minister, uh, likes the term and supports the movement. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's talk about integration. Um, cause I think that fits into the education piece, but how can we better integrate across the different disciplines, governments and industries? Yeah, I think I kind of touched on that with uh, what I was talking about before with the kind of having everyone use the same products and tools. Um, I'm not sure. I think I think making smart cities more of a pathway um, from urban planning from a very er- an earlier point of time in education is quite important. Um, I almost think that at, at the end of the day, smart cities should just be planning as well. Um, so maybe even uh, moving towards a, a, a time and a place where we will might even not need the term anymore and it'll kind of be quite a, an embedded part of the planning process. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's probably the way towards that. But I, I, I do think, I think, I think we're, we're doing pretty well uh, with the integration. And, well, I think at least the trajectory is definitely going the right way. Yeah, like you can see where it's heading kind of thing like you know obviously you're heavily involved in the um academia like the the university and the academia kind of space and you can kind of see where we're we're heading with you know teaching students to have those different you know cross-disciplinary skills so yeah i think that's really important in the smart city space for sure i guess i guess the oh yeah now thinking about i guess it would be engaging 
um, engaging non-technical users, uh, people that are um, very experienced in the field. I think there's probably still a lot, a lot to go in um, making sure that you know higher, higher up people in local government, in councils. Um, in private sector as well, um, are choosing the right technologies because these are the guys or the girls with with all of the power. Um, so making sure that they're making the right investments and the right decisions, which is a lot harder. For example, I know we're both millennials and we know, we probably um, can you know text with our eyes closed even on a smartphone, but not everyone can. Um, so kind of just making sure that 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 gap is addressed and giving young people uh, the power to uh, to be able to influence decisions that are made. Yeah, definitely. Um, I interviewed uh, Andrew Grill last, last week and he talked about digital diversity. So that's exactly what you're talking about there and making sure that on our, you know, decision-making boards and, and, you know, the people making the decisions that there is diversity, not just, you know, our backgrounds and our gender, but also our technical skills. Um, yeah, so I think that's the exact same concept you're talking about there. So let's talk about emerging trends. Oh, very exciting, yeah. I want to. Yeah, let's talk about ones. What do you think people aren't talking about at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, something something that I I'm personally very interested in is um is called like situated analytics, which essentially um, when you look at um when you look at it, a uh, kind of map or something, it's kind of like um, augmented virtual real, uh, virtuality. So you've essentially um, enhanced the virtual world with um the real world essentially so you've gone okay here's a, a virtual a fake object and i'm going to enhance it by making it realistic right and then the flip side of that which is becoming more popular is augmented reality rather than augmented virtuality right um which is you know overlaying the digital world on top of the physical world um i think that there's going to be a growing space um, and there already is a little bit of growing space in showing um data and analytics about the city um, while you're actually in that spot. Um, some of the stuff you might have already seen is like, you know, for example, when you're like waiting for a train, you see um, you see a, a, tie, a time saying like, no, this train's going to come in four minutes. Um, you could have, um, you know, your Google Glass or your augmented reality smartphone that overlays um, much more detailed analytics about that train coming, for example, whether or not it's crowded from your smartphone rather than needing to be a panel. And you could have that that experience tailored to your particular interests. Um, you could see um, a community's energy usage down the street as an overlaid um, digital display in um, augmented reality. Um, there are all sorts of, you could even uh, participate um, in kind of discussions, civic discussions using augmented reality. Say, for example, I've seen projects of um, augmented graffiti where people have kind of protested or made murals of using augmented reality graffiti on a particular space. And then they're not actually... Um, ruining the space but they're actually able to have like a community discussion in an augmented space but it's also in a real space in the real world um so i, I kind of see this field of situated uh, analytics um really exciting potential um for the smart cities movement um, in both kind of a community way and, and an informing citizens way and kind of as well as an analytical way as well um and i think that uh, I, don't, I don't i don't think it's being talked about too much yet yeah, no, I agree. I think um, virtual reality and yeah, augmented reality definitely has so much potential. And I mean, you think about a really silly example of Pokemon Go. Obviously, it's dead now. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't play it, but maybe other people, hardcore fans, still do. But when that took off, that was insane, right? That was our first kind of taste of this augmented reality in a very basic kind of, you know, gamification level. And, like, I don't play games on my phone. Um, I, it doesn't interest me. I must be really boring or something. But I downloaded Pokemon Go because I had to see what it was all about. And then I got a little bit addicted. And so then, like, my boyfriend and I were, like, driving around the streets of Toowoomba trying to find you know, Pikachus and that kind of thing. And, like, it's just insane that 
you know, it really captured everyone's attention. I mean, I think because it was not a very practical example, it was just still a game at the end of the day, you know, it kind of died, but it really showed the kind of um, the potential of gamifying, well, that was a game, but, you know, how we could use that in a collaborative space base and in a community and yeah i think it's got so much potential and i i agree i don't think we're talking about it enough yeah um i, I and one of the reasons we're probably not talking about it is that they're incredibly expensive like if you want the proper um like headset um you'll be you'll be paying you know a few thousand dollars for that headset but um we are seeing examples of kind of lower cost um headsets for these kind of things coming up um and yeah i i assume that they're probably going to be um you know less than a hundred dollars um within the next five years uh, at least some form of good uh headset will be quite cheap um so yeah i guess there's a lot of potential for that field to really grow um and it is already um yeah i i really yeah pokemon go was um yeah quite an experience it, it was um almost uh, I, I've I've heard people say it was almost probably one of the kind of happiest moments quantitatively of human history at the moment because it, like so many people were saying so many positive things that I'm sure that um, for a brief moment there was um, a little spike of kind of virtual happiness permeating throughout the web. Yeah, wow, that's really uh, uh, that's really nice. I like that a lot. Well, it's been awesome to talk to you, Ollie. And like, obviously, we're in the same kind of emerging innovators group, but I feel like we don't get to talk enough. So that's, it's been awesome. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, it's been real. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and so it was a, I think there's a, a prompt here that says, uh, how can people connect with me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, that was my last question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I really like LinkedIn. So if anyone wants to chat about um, any of this stuff, uh, feel free to connect with me there. Yeah, cool. And I'll put um, the link to your LinkedIn on the show notes. And, yeah, if um, people want to get in touch about the Emerging Innovators, let us know as well. We're keen to have other people that are passionate about smart cities join our little gang um, and we just talk smart city stuff and, uh, yeah, have some really cool combos. Right. So thanks so much, Ollie. It's been awesome. Thanks, Joey. Great to chat. Talk to you soon. Bye. It's the Smart City Podcast. Whoa. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart City Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes can be found at thesmartcitypodcast.com. If you have any questions or comments for me or any of my guests, connect with me via email, zoe at thesmartcitypodcast.com or via the socials. I'm on Twitter and Facebook at Smart City Pod. As always, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Smart City Podcast is what you're looking for.